Hello and welcome to another exciting lecture for human sexuality. In this one we are going to be covering two topics, sexual physiology first and then hormones and development after that. The sexual physiology part is relatively short. It is a bunch of pictures with a bunch of parts and then after that we're going to look at hormones and development and how that influences that. So as I said for these in this first set of slides, when we're talking about sexual physiology, it's going to be basically a set of slides where I'm going to start with external genitalia for female, internal genitalia for female, external for male, internal for male. So we're going to look at all of that, and it's basically going to be lists and then pictures, lists and then pictures. Uh, what I'm going to say with this is I'm going to go into it a bit. But what you should really um, know is basically be able to identify the different major features that we're talking about. Um, so when we look at this, we're looking at the exter external genitalia for females. You have the, the mons pubis, which is basically the, the region that's the soft area above the pubic bone that's covered in pubic hair. Um, it does um, contain many blood vessels. So it is a region for that sexual stimulation does occur in. Then you have the labia minora and the labia majora. Um, these basically are protections. So the, the majora, the, the outer layer, is a protective external layer made of smooth, smooth muscle fibers, nerve endings, blood vessels, and lymph nodes. And it's, it's in many ways a protective area. The minora is made of two folds of skin and lie within the majora. And this area is also loaded with blood vessels and nerve receptors. So this area is very vulnerable to stimulation. Then there is the clitoris. Um, this is the most sensitive external region. Uh, it is uh, analogous, analogous um, to the, the penis. So we will talk later about development and how essentially the clitoris and the penis are mostly the same region for men and women. Um, it's made up of spongy tissue that fills with blur blood during sexual arousal. Um, it's covered for protection. So there is a, a hood over it, clitoral hood that covers it for protection. Um, and it does become engorged with blood and enlarge with sexual arousal. arousal. Then you're, there's the urethral opening which is where um, where in a sense that that or not in a sense where urine comes out of this is in the the upper regions of the the opening of the vagina um, you'll see that in the picture on the next one then you've also got the the hymen which is a protective layer um, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute as well. And then you've got the perineum. And the perineum is uh, the area between the vaginal opening and the anus. Let's look at pictures of that. So here's where you got those regions. As I said, the mons pubis is up here. You've got the labia majora and minora, the outer and inner lips, the urethral opening, the vaginal opening, so you see that the urethral opening and the vaginal opening are separate. Uh, the clitoris is up here, and the pupus of the the pupus of the prepus of the clitoris, also known as the clitoral hood. And then you've got the perineum, which is this region between the vagina and the anus, and then you've got the anus. Now. This is where I would show you a really awesome video of Adam Ruins Everything, where he talks about the hymen and um, how um, and basically the, the hymen is not an indicator of, of virginity. Um, some women, um, uh, their, their hymen tears for various different region, reasons, some for no reason at all earlier in life. Some women who are sexually active who do not have a torn hymen, um, it just stretches. So the hymen is not a good indicator of virginity. Um, I would show you that, but uh, Turner TV is really, really strict on 
taking down anything that's posted to YouTube. Um, I when I posted the STI video for you guys, uh, I included a Adam ruins everything where he talked about herpes, and I actually had to go back and cut that out because it got copyright claimed immediately and blocked. Um, so if I included the, the Adam Ruins Everything video here about the hymen, that would get this video blocked too. So I'm not going to include that. I do recommend, though, going and checking out those videos. Uh, Adam Ruins Everything, if you don't know what it is, it's a web series that eventually got picked up by Turner Broadcasting and put on True TV. But it, it essentially, he goes over various different things. And two of the things he went over in an episode on sex, both of them the, the same episode, but he went over them. One of them was about herpes and one of them was about the hymen and both of those are in the same episode. Both of those are relating to what was in the STI's lecture and this lecture. So I really recommend going back and watching that. So let's talk about internal. So now we're looking at the internal for for females. Um, we've got the the vagina, the uterus, and the endometrium inside the uterus. We've got the cervix, the fallopian tube, and the ovaries. Now we can look at each of these in depth, and let me actually switch slides, and we'll talk about those. So inside here, you've got the, the vagina. So you've got the vag vaginal opening that we already talked about. Inside that, in, in the urethra opening, here's a side view so you can see that the urethra here, let me... Um, switch to a different color. We'll do purple. Maybe that'll show up better. No, it's not. Um, we'll see if green will show up better. Yeah, that's a bit better. Maybe even a brighter green. Let me erase what's already there. Brighter green. Yep, that shows up a bit better. Not great, but that's the urethral opening and the vaginal opening. You see how they are separate, where urine is expelled and the vaginal opening um, which is for sexual reproduction as well as for where, where a baby comes out during pregnancy, during birth, um, they are separate. That, so don't get that confused where they're not separate. They are separate. Okay, so you've got the vaginal opening here. Um, goes back to about the cervix, which is here, this region here. And the vaginal opening is all of this here. Um, it's vaginal, the, the vagina region there is normally acidic. We'll talk about that later when we're talking about sperm, but it's normally acidic and it does cleanse itself through secretions and discharges that are normally um, mild white or yellow. The, there are normal secretions. So when we talked about the STI video, we talked about how um, there a lot of STIs have secretions. Well, that is excess discharge. There is normal secretions that do occur. The cervix there that I, I scribbled on um, is made up of cartilage. It feels like the tip of your nose. Um, then from behind that you have the uterus. So the uterus is this region here. So the uterus is basically when a implanted uh, embryo, uh, it'll basically implant itself on the uterine wall and this is where the fetus develops um, and one thing to to indicate is it is over the bladder this is why pregnant women usually have to pee more because the fetus when it's developing does push into the bladder inside there you have the endometrium that is the layers around the uterus it's composed of three layers the innermost layer contains the most blood vessels and glands and then during menstruation, this innermost layer is, is slothed off. Um, and this is the, the layer that the, this is the, the endometrium is what the implanted uh, ovum will, imp, or what the ovum will implant itself to, to begin development. Um, we looked at other things there. You've got the, the fallopian tubes up here which is where there's one on each side. This is where the, the um, once the egg is released from the ovary, which you see here in blue. So in blue, you see the ovary. The ovary, um, once it, the, the egg is released from the ovary, 
and first off each woman has approximately two million eggs at birth uh, once you reach maturity there's about 400,000 left but you each woman will only release about 400 during her lifetime so most of the eggs in the ovaries are not even used the over the ovary releases an egg during um, ovulation the egg is released it travels through the fallopian tube to the uterus um, it, it when conception occurs um, it tends to occur in the upper two-thirds of the fallopian tube and then from there like I said it, it travels to the uterus um, if the 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 uh, egg the implanted egg actually attaches to the fallopian tubes rather than the uterus it's what's called a entropic pregnancy and it can be very um, very hazardous to both the mother and the developing fetus the last thing I'll say is the ovaries also produce estrogen and when we get to hormones and development we'll talk about that all right the next thing to look at is males so males it's it's for external it's pretty easy you've got the the penis and the scrotum um, let's look at those so when we're talking about the penis um, we've got a uh, basically an average length in a relaxed state is two to five inches um, like I said when I was talking about female external it is very similar to the clitoris and females when we talk about hormones and development we'll look at how they basically develop from the same structures depending on the specific hormones that are released during development um, the the prepuce um, which if you recall when I was talking about the clitoris was the clitoral hood um, that is the foreskin on males on, around the penis um, and the one of the differences here though is is the tip of the penis has the glands which is where both um, the urethra opening and so where urine passes through as well as where semen passes through um, you've got the coronal ridge I don't have I don't see it here but the coronal ridge is going to be this ridge around um, it it helps seal the vagina during intercourse and we talked about sperm competition before it helps displace rival sperm uh, just like the um, enlarging of the clitoris the enlarging of the penis incur occurs due to um, blood pooling in the spongy tissues so again they're very similar in that way then you've got the um, scrotum and the testes and we're not going to talk about those quite yet the we'll talk about the external the scrotum is the protective sac um, the protective skin it helps regulate temperature it when it's colder it is pulled in tighter to keep the the testicles warm when it is hotter when when it is warmer um, it is stretched out long um, to keep the the testicles cool because sperm need a regular temperature and there is one testicle on each side we will get to the internal in just a second here so let's look at the internal so the internal there's quite a bit here um, you've got the the testes themselves the epidermis the vas deferens the seminal vesicles the prostate gland the cowper's gland and the urethra let's actually look at the picture and we'll talk about each of these so we we should point out that okay we talked about the the pen, penis already and the urethra so the urethra is the opening that goes through the penis um, let me actually erase that and do it in a different color what color can we look at here let's see if bright blue works so you've got yeah, that kind of works you've got the urethra is the opening the, that goes through the penis that is for what both urine and sperm come out of um, that's it's the passageway um, we'll come back to sperm itself but then you've got the 
the testes themselves that are what's in blue down here. Um, the, the testes, uh, essentially, they, they descend around the age of two. Um, they, they don't necessarily hang at the, at the same height from the body. Actually, the left one tends to hang slightly lower than the right one. Um, during spermatogenesis, which is when um, uh, sperm is produced, um, the, the, the tubules in the testes produce um, uh, sperm. Um, then they also produce testosterone. That's important when we come back to hormones and development. And the sperm can actually be stored for up to six weeks in each of the testes and the epidermis of each of the testes. So the epidermis is the, the surrounding tissue around the testicles. Um, then from there, you get the uh, vas deferens. So the vas deferens is going to be this tube right here that goes through. The vas deferens is just basically a tube that, that um, where sperm leaves the testicles during the, the process of ejaculation. So sperm leaves the testicles, it goes through the vas deferens um, and towards the urethra. Uh, as it's going through, it passes through the seminal vesicles so the seminal vesicles are right here. It passes through the seminal vesicles and during, well, as it passes through the seminal vesicles, um, uh, fluid is added to the sperm. So the sperm, they're very thick as they get to the seminal vesicles, then the seminal vesicles add in a alkaline fluid that's high in fructose and it, it actually protects the sperm as they move through the urethra and um, to a lesser extent, it will help neutralize the acidity of the vagina. But one of the main things is, is it protects the sperm. It also um, is nutrition for the sperm, which allows them to survive for a few days after um, they've been ejaculated. So about 60% of the ejaculatory fluid is this fluid from the seminal vesicles. Seminal vesicles. So after it, it goes through the seminal vesicles, it continues to, to pass through. Now it's going to pass through the prostate here. The prostate gland produces more fluid. Um, this fluid helps um, mobility and longevity of the sperm. And this fluid's main purpose is to neutralize the acidity of the vagina so sperm could survive. Without this fluid, sperm would die in, in the acidity of the vagina. So the the prostate gland reduces a fluid that neutral, its main purpose is to neutralize the acidity of the vagina. Um, this is about 30% of ejaculatory fluid. So as you can see, if we've got 60% in the seminal vesicles, 60 to 70%, about 30% from the prostate gland, then, then you can see here that there isn't much of the, the ejaculatory fluid that's actually sperm. Um, then from there, it passes through the Cowper's gland here. So the Cowper's gland is going to contribute in here. It's going to pass through. The Cowper's gland is going to add more um, seminal fluid, a little bit more neutralizing fluid. Um, fluid it's going to neutralize. It's, this is where um, the fluid you have during sex before orgasm, um, sometimes called precum. This is the fluid that's pre-ejaculate. This fluid is released in order to, um, its main purpose, it serves two main purposes, but one purpose is for lubrication, but the other main purpose is to neutralize the acidity in the urethra. So um, urine is acidic. If this wasn't neutralized, the sperm passing through could be could die from it. So the Cowper's gland releases fluids um, into the urethra to neutralize that acidity. Um, this, the, the one thing to note is this fluid, the fluid that's in um, pre-orgasm fluids, actually may contain some sperm. That is why the method of pulling out isn't 100% foolproof because pre-ejaculate fluids actually can contain some sperm. And this is a 
thick, clear mucus that's high in alk alkaline. And then it finally goes out the through the urethra, out the penis during ejaculation. During ejaculation, about 300 million sperm are expelled, and it's about 20 to 35 million sperm per cubic centimeter um, are needed as a minimum to, to consider it as fertility. So this is a, a process where a lot of sperm are released during ejaculation. Okay, that is the end of um, physiology, of, of the sexual physiology. Now we're going to transition into hormones and development. So from here on out, we're going to be looking at hormones and development. We're going to look at still taking into consideration that physiology, but now we're going to look at the things, parts of the physiology that develop at certain times. We're going to look at what hormones go into development, what some hormonal abnormalities are, those types of things. I'm going to warn you ahead of time that um, some of the, the pictures I have in these slides are actual pictures of people. You Typically what I'm showing is when we're looking at abnormal development, but I've even got pictures of normal development. So it, just be aware so you're not shocked when we get to those. Um, the ones I, I, I put in just the physiology wasn't actual pictures, it was just drawings. Some of the, the things we're going to have coming up are actual pictures. Um, but those aren't for a while. We'll get to those in, in the, the later portions of this lecture. So, very basic stuff. What do you get for offspring? Well, the female parent provides X, uh, only X genes. So the, the egg is going to be an X. It, it's the, the, the chromosomes are split into their respective pairs, um, but they've got, um, they're each are gonna be an X for a female parent. For a male, you've got X and Y, so sperm will either be X sperm or Y sperm. It should be, I should point out that um, Y sperm tend to be smaller and faster. Um, they, they is why, um, why the gender ratio at, uh, in conception is higher for male because Y sperm swim faster. They, they, but X sperm will live longer. X sperm can live up to three to four days. So, whereas Y sperm tend to live much lower time. But when they come together, if it's an X sperm, it results in a female offspring. If it's a Y sperm, it results in a male offspring with certain genetic abnormalities that can occur, which we will talk about in a bit. As far as male and female sexual development, so this is something we're going to talk about in a bit here, but this is testosterone specifically. So here we're talking about testosterone. Um, the next, for females, we'll talk about estradiol, but testosterone specifically, there is, during development, there is a f considerably large spike of testosterone in the womb. And this results in um, sexual differentiation. Uh, actually, there's uh, a significant portion of development that has been linked to sexual orientation with testosterone in the womb. If the testosterone is not at the right levels, that can result in differences in sexual orientation. But that being said, all of this, there's a spike. And then at birth, it, testosterone levels out down below. But then in the first few months of life, there's also an activation of testosterone. And this is where you get some differentiation, sexual differentiation during the, that, that starts in the first few months of life. But then after about three months of life, it levels out again um, and it does not start to spike again until puberty. And one thing that this gets wrong is I would actually put it more like this because testosterone starts to spike again at about seven to eight 
but it doesn't go up that high. It just starts to spike at seven to eight and then doesn't have a super spike until what we classically define as puberty. So one thing when we're talking about this, when we're talking about puberty, we have to look at the fact that what we classically define as puberty, uh, so andra arch in males, which is the first ejaculation, um, is is a sperm arch or andra arch, the first ejaculation, that's actually years after the hormonal changes of puberty start. It's when the hormonal changes of puberty spike, but the hormonal changes of puberty actually start as as young as six or seven, where we start to have a slight increase in, in the sexual hormones. It doesn't spike though until you're looking at about 11 to 12 range. And then it spikes really high up. Um, and this is where andro arch happens um, in maturation of the reproductive system, all of that. And it, it stays pretty high up here into the, the 20s and the 30s. It, it actually starts to go down after you get into long-term relationships. It goes down when you have children, things like that. And then it declines later in life. There's a reason for that decline, and that is because high testosterone actually is associated with higher risk of cancer. So a reduction in testosterone later in life reduces a male's chance of getting cancer. This is why all those ads out there that are talking about testosterone replacement therapy for older men who have lost their testosterone, um, I wouldn't be surprised if those companies ended up getting sued in the future for the same reason um, tobacco companies have been sued because those com companies know that tes higher testosterone in life is actually linked to and can cause an increased risk of cancer, yet they're still marketing that as something that, that people should do. The only reason you should get testosterone replacement is if you're down here, and then you get it replaced up to the normal levels, not up to levels of up here. In females, um, there is only a slight bump of estradiol during um, fetal development. The reason for the big difference here we'll talk about in just a few minutes, but is the different systems. Um, the, the natural inclination is for female. It actually takes um, the hormonal development to, to shift the natural development to male. So that's why there isn't much in the hormonal regions for females during, um, during the, the pregnancy, during fetal development. Um, and it's flat from early on through birth. And actually, like I said, I would say that it starts doing this. It starts earlier again in girls, these, these early things, um, start as early as six or seven even if the classical definition of um, of puberty in girls is menarch, uh, first period, it, it, the hormonal changes of puberty start years earlier. It just isn't until you get to that age around 10 where it spikes. And then you get menopause that occurs after that. So a continuation from what we talked about earlier, there are three categories of the sex organs, the primary sex characteristics, the internal, the external, let me get those up, the internal, the external, and the gonads. We included the gonads with the internal before, now we're gonna kind of separate them out into their own, the gonads being the testes or the ovaries. Um, these um, develop first during early fetal development uh, if there is the presence of SRY, which the SRY gene, uh, that's the X and Y gene, the SRY gene, it's on the Y chromosome, um, it results in testes, otherwise it's ovaries. So in natural, without any outside force, ovaries develop. It's with outside force that testes develop. 
Um, the, the critical period during this is 7 to 12 weeks. Critical period is the period when it's developing the most, when outside forces can have the most impact. So if there's pollutants, teratogens, um, the, the mother's doing drugs, things like that, during seven weeks 7 to 12 is when the, the period of time where this is developing the most is, uh, or they're the most vulnerable to these external forces to then have abnormal development. So, like I said, when the, the gonads become um, either testes or ovaries, depending on the presence of the SRY gene, looking at that in males, in the seventh week, the outer portions of the gonads degenerate and the inner portions develop into the testes. In females, it is the in the eleventh week the inner portions degenerate and the outer portions develop into the ovaries. So when we look at this, um, and we'll come back to this when we look at the the Wolfian system um, and how that works. But basically, what it comes down to is is that in the, in the presence of the SRY gene, the outer portions of the gonads will degenerate and the inner portions will develop. Without the presence of the SRY gene, the inner portions degenerate and the outer portions develop into the ovaries. So um, when we're looking at the gonads becoming the testes, uh, the, you get this is where um, the, the testes then produce uh, the, the androgen glands. Um, and the androgen glands, the, the different glands that, that are producing the male hormones, the androgens. So the testes and the, the, the endocrine glands that are producing these, are, and specifically the testes, are producing androgens. The testes also release, though, malarian inhibiting substance. So this is something we'll come back to, but the malarian inhibiting substance, basically as a result of the SRY gene, causing the outer portions to degenerate and the inner portions to develop. It then results in malarian inhibiting substance being released. And this malarian inhibiting substance release is what results in most male sexual development. So when we look at this, most changes re reflect the presence or absence of androgen and the presence or absence of malarian inhibiting substance. It's a combination of the two. In females, the, the gonads become the ovaries. The ovaries um, produce um, female hormones. They're the endocrine gland that produces female hormones, specifically androgen, but also um, all of the other ones, there's going to be three or four different ones we're going to look at. The main one, the specific one, being estrogen. You'll notice here that there is no um, substance subsequent or supplemental to it that's released like in the, the, the testes, because in the testes it's basically releasing the malarian inhibiting substance because, again, as I've said a few times, and I'll say it again and just coming up in a little bit, the natural development is for female. It takes external pressure, external forces to change the female development into male development. So females don't need that extra thing to develop. Males do. So looking at that real quick, um, you get the uh, undifferentiated and the, the undifferentiated results in male differentiation when the, the uh, Wolfian ducts, we'll, we'll use those terms in just a second, the Wolfian ducts are the ones that are, are left, result in the male um, differentiation, whereas the malarian ducts are in female differentiation. And when we talked about that, one of the things I said for the hormones that are released by males one of the hormones that's released is malarian inhibiting substance. That is where it comes into where the, um, the malarian ducts are inhibited. The malarian system is inhibited by the malarian inhibiting hormone. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. I just put this slide in essentially so you can see all of the different things that are going on with the, the 
neuroendocrinology uh, of basically the what's going on with neuron development, hormones, what's going on with neurotransmitters, all of this, what's being developed and what's resulting in influencing sexual function. You've got all these different ones i'm not going to go into all of these different ones just note that there is a whole bunch of different hormones that are responsible for sexual function so a bit more on the the systems the internal sex organ precursors you have that malarian system which is female this develops into the the fallopian tubes the uterus the vagina you've got the wolfian system which is the male system. This develops into the epidermis, the vas deferens, the seminal vesicles. And what these result is, is a, a function of the hormones released by the te testes. Natural effect is to be female. The malarian inhibiting hormone is a, has a defeminizing effect. Testosterone has a mascula, masculinizing effect. So this is where those two differences are going to come in. Um, malarian has a defeminizing effect. Androgens, testosterone mainly, has a masculinizing effect. You can have a mismatch of these where you don't get the defeminizing effect, but you have a masculinizing effect. Or you don't you get the defeminizing effect, but you don't get the masculinizing effect. We'll look at some of the disorders later that look at what happens when one of the two of these is prop, appropriate or normal and the other is abnormal. So at seven weeks, we still have external genitalia that's undifferentiated. Pay attention to the colors here, the light blue, the dark blue, the yellow. Pay attention to those as we look at the next two slides, which have sexual differentiation. But you'll notice that there's really no sexual differentiation here. Um, that it's kind of just the, the, you have some startings of some regions, but it's really just a undifferentiated genital area. By about 11 weeks, you'll start to see the differentiation occurring. So that yellow region we talked about, it's the glands. It, it becomes slightly larger in, in males with the urethral tag inside of it, whereas in females, the urethra, urethral tag will fall down below. Um, those other regions, the, the light blue, the dark blue, the green, they start to differentiate and, and slide to their regions, but we don't have full differentiation by this point. We still have it pretty similar. Whereas at this point, we start to get full differentiation. So that dark blue portion became the, the shaft of the penis. It became the, the body or the pupus in a way of the clitoris, um, the prepuce of the, the male and the prepuce of the female is in the same region. It pulled out there. The green region that was all the way on the outside turns into the scrotum in the male and the outer labia in the female. And then the, the yellow, or not, sorry, the blue region um, ended up becoming the basically a line that is seals it together in the male and it's separated for the female at least until you get to the region below the vagina. So looking at that in pictures, in the 11 to 12 weeks you've got the undifferentiated still but by 19 weeks you've got fully differentiated. So the, the external, it's still undifferentiated at, at about 12 weeks, so differentiation starting, but by 19 weeks you get differentiation. In males, at 15 weeks you've got partial differentiation, and by even 16 weeks you get more full differentiation. So it sh shows that that differentiation can actually occur pretty quickly. Let's look a little bit more at the androgen system, mainly testosterone. And this is looking at the, in males, there's a larger, um, basically sexually dimorphic nucleus of the preoptic area in the hypothalamus. 
basically what happens here is that this results in a greater in release of androgens and it develops into later male sexual behavior. In females, they have a smaller um, dimorphic nucleus of the preoptic area of the hypothalamus, which ends up making for female sexual behavior being slightly suppressed compared to males. Let's though look at what happens when we have dysfunctions of androgen, androgen specifically. So androgen insensitivity syndrome is the first one we're going to look at. And in this one, it's a genetic mutation that prevents the formation of androgen receptors. So there's the androgen receptors in the neurons don't form, so the androgens don't bind to neurons. Um, so here, the gonads will become testes, which is a normal process. Defemination, defeminization will occur, which is a normal process. But you will have lack of masculization. Remember, recalling the the malarian inhibiting substances, the defeminization. Well, um, androgen is masculization. So with androgen and sensitivity syndrome, you still get defeminization, but you don't get masculization. So what you have here is an XY male with female external genitalia. And when I say male and female here, I'm talking about biological sex, not gender. So an XY male that has female external genitalia um, will have a woman's body, but not the internal female sex organs because the defeminization occurred, but the lack of masculinization. So masculinization did not occur. Here's a couple examples. The left is a mild form. Um, the, the body resembles in some ways male in some ways female uh, kind of a mix of the two biological again uh, the externals look female but there's in, in cases where it's a mild form it's it's not fully there whereas in the one on the right looks fully female it's complete androgen and sensitivity um, the the so the um, external looks completely female however the internal is there is not internal female sex organs. People with androgen insensitivity syndrome tend to be sterile. The next one we'll look at is um, malarian, persistent malarian duct syndrome. So if um, malarian system being in, in place results in defeminization, a uh, persistent malarian duct syndrome should be the opposite of that, where failure to produce anti-malarian hormone results in um, the, the defeminization does not occur. So in this case, a person will be born with both sets of internal organs because they're developing both the Wolfian and the malarian structures. They've got XY and XY male here, but so they're, and they get typically get androgen release but they don't have the defeminization of the anti-malarian hormone. So the, it, it usually results from a, a problem with the SNRY gene. The next is Turner's. So Turner's sy syndrome is where an individual only has one X chromosome. So will be female or typically female but is essentially going to have a, a lot of other issues here. Um, can result in things like dwarfism, but um, so external development is into female normal, though tends to have uh, a, when it comes to breasts, tends to not have fully developed breasts. Uh, no ovaries, so there's no estrogen being produced. You need two X chromosomes for ovaries. It tends to have a shorter stature, a short web neck. Um, so Turner and people with Turners are, are, as far as I'm aware, always sterile. They cannot have children because they don't develop ovaries. There's no way for them to have children. The next is Kleinfelters. 
Klinefelter's is similar, but in this case, and similar on the opposite end of the spectrum. It's an XY with an extra X. So you get um, male hypogonadalism, where there, there will be atrophy of the testicles, leads to infertility, the body hair is distributed like a female, um, tends to have long limbs and narrower shoulders, uh, can have small breasts. When a penis is present, it's small, but it's there. So this is where um, the body is basically trying to develop into both male and female and doesn't fully develop as a result. Let's look at some of the atypical genitals um, in these next couple slides. Um, looking back at things like uh, the partial androgen insensitivity and what that can do to the genitals. So atypical genitalia, you can have uh, ovotesticular disorder. Um, many of these are ones that result in a mix of the two where you can have testicles and, and a vagina at times. Um, testicles and a small penis. You can have a penis and a vagina. Um, these are not true hermaphrodisms though, because both systems are not functional. That is going to be the difference between hermaphrodism and um, these atypical genitalia is these either no systems are working or only one system's working. True hermaphrodism, both systems are working. Uh, the congenital adrenal hyperplasia, um, again, is where you get ambiguous genitalia. You, you get a, um, a vagina when present. It doesn't have the, the same organs inside. The, the clitoris tends to be enlarged, almost penis-shaped. I'm going through these relatively quick. The partial androgen insensitivity that we looked at before um, can result in some of the same types of things, um, like the one on the left where you've basically got a, a vagina and testicles. So there's going to be no ovaries there. Um, it's just, it's there's a wide range of different things that can occur. I'm not going to go into each of them. It's beyond the scope of this class. Just note that there's a wide range of things that can occur depending on um, the androgens released, the malarian inhibiting substance released, all of those, how they're released, how much of each occurs, other genetic things that occur, and you can just get a wide range that's between. And I should say that this is actually much more common than you would think. It's not common, it's rare, but it's much more common than like one in a million type thing. Whereas the next one is extremely rare. That is true hermaphrodism. True hermaphrodism is when you get a XY and an XX within the same individual. This is extremely rare. There's very few documented cases where it's actually um, where it actually happened, but it does happen. And this is where uh, both systems are present and both systems are working. The, the male side produces a penis and testes and can produce sperm. The female side produces ovaries and can produce eggs. Um, it is possible, again, extremely, extremely rare for someone with true hermaphrodism to get themselves pregnant. Just a couple others we're going to look at here at the end before we, we switch is 46XY. This is where you've got SRY deletion in an XY. So um, you can uh, get Sawyer syndrome. You can get uh, Frazier and uh, Denny's Drash syndrome. Uh, there's just lots of different things. You can get 46XX male. Um, so 46XY female is cases where there's an X and a Y, but it's the result is female. XX male is where the you have an XX, but you get male. So it's just really strange that these can occur, but these can occur is the point. Okay, 
let's transition now into um, the the other parts let's look at sexual development not sexual organ development sexual development sexuality actually begins in the womb um, reflective displays of genital arousal erection in boys um, begins in the womb both boys and girls do continue to experience reflex induced genital arousal throughout infancy and childhood so genital arousal in infancy and childhood is not abnormal there isn't sexual thoughts at least not in the same way there isn't sexual arousal to to um to external things like images and sounds it would be more reflex induced where there's um, genital arousal to to touch in different ways even before the age of two egocentrism results so this is a lack of understanding of others point of view so during this time genital exploration is actually a natural part of learning about one's own body during the earliest stage of development children um, are exploring the world they're exploring their body they're exploring um, their arms their hands their feet and part of that is exploring their own genitals that is normal then after age two social play begins this is where general exploration will expand beyond their own body and curious about curiosity about others this does though tend to peak at about three to five this is where your classic stereotypical playing doctor stage occurs so sexual exploration of games will occur like touching the self and others talking about sex noticing difference between boys and girls between children and adults again this is normal this isn't sex itself this is ex exploration of the world learning where, where children are learning about themselves and the differences between themselves and others we're not talking about actual children having sex we're talking about the sexual exploration games like playing doctor however if there's aggressive sexual behaviors so behaviors where if they're playing doctor they're not just exploring they're actually being aggressive about it this actually may be indicative of abuse and should be investigated so if the child's being abused they may act that out on others including themselves um, like I said sexual ex sexual exploration games early in infancy and childhood especially with same-sex playmates they're normal it only becomes harmful when um, when the parents response to it actually frightens or shames the child so uh, if the the child becomes shamed about it or becomes frightened that can actually internalize um, sexual dysfunction that can result in later issues what you should do if you catch children at this age um, playing doctor or whatnot socialize them that privacy is what's important rather than punishing them for the act because if you punish them for the act then like I said that actually is linked to later deviant behaviors um, if you do need to stop the behavior when it's inappropriate like in public or if it's going too far things like that it's actually better to distract the child rather than scolding or slapping their hands away from them touching themselves whatnot distract them away from it um, distracting is always going to be better than punishing I hate to make an analogy to to dogs here but when you're training dogs um, it's always best if they're let's say they're chewing on something they shouldn't be chewing on instead of punishing them smacking them hitting them with yelling at them for chewing on what they shouldn't be chewing on because all that teaches them to do is chew on that thing in private or hide it from you if they're if it's shoes they take them to hide now to chew on them yelling at them does that instead of that you distract them from it and eventually they they become aware that that these other things are more interesting the same works for children at this age D yelling at them only makes them do this more but in in ways that are deviant rather than um, distracting them away and the behavior will naturally reduce in the school age years 7 to 11 um, Freud's sexual latency stage is BS it's not supported 
Um, children in, in other cultures begin continue sex play. Um, in our culture, children learn that it should be hidden from adults because of the way we naturally just punish kids who are engaging in sex play. Again, sex play is not sex itself. It's more sexual exploration. By age nine, most social play is with same-sex friends, including sex exploration games. Uh, girls tend to be treated more harshly than boys when caught engaging in sex play, though. So this is where, um, again, the way you react is, is very important. Let's look at puberty. So puberty actually begins, like I said earlier, it begins earlier than most people realize. It begins, puberty occurs when the hypothalamus begins secreting gonadotropal releasing hormone, GnRH, and it causes the pituitary gland to release follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, and luteinizing hormone, LH. In males, these hormones stimulate testes to produce sperm and secrete testosterone. In females, they stimulate the ovaries to produce estradiol, estrogens. This begins earlier than what what you would think it actually it's a process let's actually look at it on the next slide it's a process that begins really early in the last several years so andron arch begins at about the age of six to eight and this is where the adrenal glands start to secrete androgen hormone and converts testosterone and estrogen so this is where um, in both boys and girls, it begins at about six to eight and this process starts occurring. Then several years later, you get gonad arch, gonadal arch. Um, gonad arch is where the pituitary gland releases FSH and LH that we talked about on the previous slide. And the, the testes start to produce sperm and testosterone and the ovaries, ovaries start to release ova and produce estrogen and progesterone. This is though this is when the secondary sexual characteristics start to occur. This right here is when we classically define as puberty occurring, when gonad arch occurs. However, it actually starts, it's a process that starts many years earlier. So in girls, the first sign of puberty, even before um, uh, first period is breast buds begin to appear. Uh, on average, they begin at about 11.2 years of age, some earlier, some later. Then the growth spurt occurs at about age 12, goes through about age 16 in most girls. Um, fatty deposits form on the hips and buttocks. This actually causes um, identity issues and appearance issues, though this is normal. Um, pubic hair and after a few years underarm hair appears. Um, the sweat and sebaceous glands start to appear or start to, to operate. So acne starts to occur. And then at about age 12 to 13 on average, some girls much earlier, some girls much later, menarche occurs. Menarche is first period in girls. So this is again that classical definition of the start of puberty for girls. One thing to point out is the attitudes about menarche vary differ greatly from culture to culture. Some welcome it, some it's a celebration. Some hide it and it's it's something to be embarrassed about. So it's it's really something that that should be considered or thought about when you're talking about the fact that um, this can cause a lot of issues with girls if this is something that, that causes shame. So one thing that, that I hope you get from this class, one of the main things I hope you get from this class is when it comes to sex and sexuality, it is important to be open, communicative, and honest. And this includes with children about puberty. And when they reach puberty, to be open and honest about it so there isn't this these feelings of, of dread and fear and all of that that comes with um, certain cultural norms about puberty. In boys, so the first sign of puber puberty is the, the testicular growth. 
Um, then the, the testicles stimulate the growth of the penis, the prostate gland, and the seminal vesicles. Um, growth of pubic hair begins around ages of 11 to 12, finishes about 15. Ejaculation is possible about a year after the penis starts growing. This is where, um, where you get sperm arch, which is the, the, the classical definition of puberty in boys, where ejaculation first occurs. During this time, nocturnal emissions are possible, voice deepening is possible, underarm and facial hair, those sweat and sebaceous glands appear, all of those are in this process. Whenever we talk about puberty, we should talk about precocious or delayed puberty. Precocious is early puberty. This is puberty before the ages of 11 to 12 in girls and before eight to nine in boys. Um, it, this is where premature activation of the pituitary hormones due to early weight gain, hormones in meat, milk, chemical pollutants, all of those types of things can cause this to be early. Girls on average are hitting puberty earlier due to the hormones that are in food and in the water. And, and also because of a healthy diet. We'll talk about that in a minute, but a healthy diet actually leads to puberty earlier. Um, there are girls as early as seven to eight hitting puberty. There's some earlier, but those are, are the extreme exceptions. But there's girls as early as seven to eight hitting puberty basically due to this. Conversely, delayed puberty is when the secondary sex characteristics and physical growth do not begin in early adolescence. Typically, this is treatable with gonadotropin-releasing hormone and androgens, or androgens. Um, so this is something that is treatable if, if the child is, has gotten to like 13 or 14 and hasn't reached puberty. You can have doctors check their hormonal levels and possibly get them on hormone replacement. And then with hormone replacement, everything becomes basically normal after that. Nutrition does affect age of puberty, though. This is something that has really changed um, from historical. We, most girls didn't reach puberty, actual puberty, regular, have regular periods until about age of 17 to 18. Now girls are having regular periods as early as 13 to 14 and having first periods much before that. So nutrition does affect age of puberty because um, in, in developing countries, what ends up happening is, is that girls are reaching puberty earlier. Um, though, on the other hand, uh, girls that are thin, so girls with eating disorders, girls that are athletes, things like that, they actually reach puberty later due to the presence of, of leptin. And this actually can adversely affect athletes because athletes who want to grow bigger as they're going through their, their development, um, they can actually, if they're, they're athletes, they can reach puberty later and it keeps them smaller. So if they're playing a sport that they need to be small, gymnastics, things like that, it doesn't adversely affect them. It actually may be a benefit to, to, to do that. But for those who are doing more physical athletics, it's one of those where this is actually harming their development by them being too thin and them not getting enough, uh, enough calories in their diet. Overweight girls reach puberty earlier than average, and healthy girls reach puberty earlier than average as well. So um, health and, and weight are both important. Next, let's talk about sexual behavior before puberty. So pubertal changes in the brain, increased sexual desire. Uh, making sexual risk-taking behaviors more likely. This, so puberty itself leads to an increased sexual desire. This should be self-explanatory. But it's it's one of those when people question why the kids that are 12, 13, 14 are engaging in sex. Well, it's because kids are hitting puberty earlier and puberty does cause an increase in sexual desire. These This increase in sexual desire actually occurs before what we classically define as, as puberty. The first sexual attractions tend to occur at about the age of 10. Um, this is after Andernarch, but before Gonadarch. So after these hormones start being released, but before the spike in hormones. 
So sexual attractions can occur and um, masturbation at this point in time, even to orgasm, is not uncommon. Even before the age of 10, children can masturbate to orgasm, and they do. Um, I've heard some reports that um, it's becoming regular for both boys and girls to start masturbating at least in part as early as 6 to 7. Um, this is again because that's when that, that those hormones are starting to be released from Andernarch. Sexual attraction though, that leads to sexual fantasy. Sexual fantasy leads to sexual exploration games like spin the bottle. And um, there, there is um, more and more erotic content in early childhood than, it, than exploration games that do occur. So it's something that is increasing. Uh, especially as diets and all of that change and, and as cultural norms become more accepting and more open, these things will change as well. In other cultures where there, there is different culturing norms, there's different uh, rules and norm, normalities for sexual exploration games. There are some cultures where um, boys in the, the ages, prepubescent boys, in the ages of like 10 to 14 will actually engage in sex with each other um, but then once they get to about 13 to 14 they completely stop doing that it's not classified as homosexuality because it's something that's occurring before full puberty is occurring once puberty occurs it the there is no longer that is no longer occurring so it is again viewed more as a sexual exploration game than sex itself and that again it all depends on the sex the norms of the culture the sexual norms of the culture we are a more closed culture so our norms are to be more to have it more hidden so there is less known in our culture than in other cultures so as the, the secondary sex characteristics after the onset of puberty occur in females, estradiol causes an enlarging of the breasts, the growth of the lining of the uterus, a widening of the hips, a maturation of the genitalia. Androgens also affect females. This is where you get underarm and pubic hair, the face as well. Most girls have facial hair as well. It's just not as prominent as it is with males. It's actually very common for females, most girls have facial hair. Girls that, that are blonde, it's it, it's not as pre, as noticeable. But girls with, that are have darker colored hairs, it becomes more noticeable. Males androgens um, cause facial underarm and pubic hair, deepening of voice, altering of hairline, muscle development, and maturation of the genitalia. And males also have estradiol, which can cause an enlarging of the breast. Too much estradiol, too much estrogens, like in the water or in foods, can actually cause enlarged breasts in males. This is why males who are overweight tend to have enlarged breasts, because in the fat cells, estrogen gets stored, and that is then released into the system and causes an enlarging of the breasts. Specific to male androgens, um, it's again synthesized and secreted by the cells of the testes. It's controlled by the FSH and the ICSH, the intracellular stimulating hormone. And again, like I said, it, it develops the secondary sex characteristics um, and initiates spermatogenesis. Uh, we already talked about all of that, so this is already a long lecture. I'm just moving through it pretty fast. The point I bring this back up is testosterone has adverse effects. The adverse effects is if there's too much testosterone in young boys before puberty, it can actually impair bone growth. However, in later adulthood, it increases the risk of cancer. I talked about this a little bit ago, but I just want to reiterate this. The risk of cancer increases dr drastically with increased levels of testosterone in later adulthood. Uh, it, anytime you see that, that um, testosterone replacement therapy, um, drugs, the ads for that, just be aware that, that they are 
using um, persuasion tactics on you to basically say that you're less of a man because your testosterone went down. That is not true. You, all you're doing by doing the testosterone replacement is increasing your chance of dying young. Estrogen and progesterone, again, they regulate the development and the maintenance of the female reproductive system and the secondary sex characteristics. And cycling of FSH and estrogen influences the female menstrual cycle, which we'll talk about in just a minute. The adverse effects of estrogen, though, involve a whole bunch of things. Nausea, vomiting, breast swelling, fluid retention, weight gain, um, high blood pressure, breast cancer, uterine cancer, cervical cancer. Why is this important? Well, estrogen is normal at certain levels. However, it should be very much pointed out that estrogen is in birth control. Estrogen and progesterone are the two components of birth control. It is why all of these things on this slide are actually side effects of being on birth control, especially if you're on birth control too long. So that's something to consider when you're on hormonal birth control Hormonal birth control actually has these as side effects. So you should not remain on hormonal birth control that long. They say 10 years is the most you should be on it. Progesterone, um, this is secreted um, the last two weeks of the menstrual, menstrual cycle. Um, it's where the uterine lining begins the secretory phase. It's where the uterine lining starts to where the, the, the menstruation begins. Um, it's essential for maintenance and integrity of the placenta and embryo. It basically um, is part of the process of menstruation. However, there's adverse side effects like nausea, fever, weight gain, headaches, dizziness, and diminished sex drive. Again, hormonal birth control also contains progesterone. So it has these side effects. Let's look at the, the female cycle. So uh, at puberty, the female reproductive system matures. Menarche is the first menstrual period. It, it occurs between nine and 17, but typically around the age of 12 now. Ovulation is the phase of the menstrual cycle at which the ovarian wall, ovarian wall ruptures and releases a mature egg. So ovulation is where an egg is released into the fallopian tubes. Um, and it, it floats around in the fallopian tubes for only about two to three days. It does not last that long. But throughout the cycle, you have the menstrual cycle where there's three phases. We're not going to count the ovulatory phase as a phase. Ovulatory phase is not a phase. doesn't make sense, but the ovulatory phase is not a phase. You've got the follicular phase. This is the, the phase prior to ovulation after menstruation this tends to last about uh, four days um, then you've got ovulation that occurs then you've got the luteal phase um, that, that occurs after ovulation this lasts about two weeks and then you've got the menstrual phase that, that lasts about a week five days um, so the follicular phase can be up to a week, sometimes less. The menstrual phase can be up to a week. The secretory phase, is uh, the luteal phase, is about two weeks. Um, and yeah, let's look at the next couple slides looking at what goes on here. So the hormonal control of the reproductive cycle, this is a bit more beyond the scope of the class, but I did want to put it here. First, you begin with the secretion of SHH to stimulate growth of the ovary follicles. Um, then the ovary and follicles mature and uh, causing the growth of the lining of the uterus, increasing the levels of estradiol, triggers the release of luteinizing hormone, causing ovulation, the release of the egg. Egg enters the fallopian tube and starts migrating towards the uterus. It meets the sperm and becomes fertilized and, and begins to divide, then attaches to the uterine wall. And if it's not fertilized, the ruptured ovarian follicle and the lining of the uterine wall are expelled when menstruation commences. So it's a cycle that looks like this. You've got the menstrual phase, 
the proliferate phase that's leading up to ovulation. The ovulation is in there. Then the secretory phase where it's basically going back to the menstrual phase where the body is detecting to see if it is um, if the egg has embedded itself on the uterine wall or not. As far as the hormones, so progesterone is in blue, as you can see. Um, so you've got the, the proliferate phase. You've got this spike right here. The spike right here is about where ovulation is. So progesterone spikes up when ovulation occurs. Um, estrogen spikes just before ovulation. Uh, luteinizing hormone spikes at, at ovulation, whereas FS, FSH spike during the secretory phase. This period of time right here when uh, uh, the FSH and estrogen is now spiking again or going up again is basically where, where it's telling the body, okay, the it implanted on the uterine wall or it didn't implant on the uterine wall. And if it didn't, then you get menstruation. A couple different things that can happen during the menstrual cycle. First is dysmenorrhea. This is mild or severe discomfort during menstruation, um, where you get pelvic cramps, nausea, headaches, backaches, bloating. This is the, again, mild or severe, but this isn't a regular or a normal thing. It's basically dysmenorrhea is a intermittent mild to severe pain. Um, it, that's differentiating from the next thing we're going to be talking about, which is a regularly occurring, whereas this is an intermittent. It doesn't make it any less severe when it occurs, but it's intermittent, so it's not considered necessarily a disorder. Whereas premenstrual syndrome, PMS, is, and it's symptoms that affect many women during the four to six days prior to menstruation each month. So this is where, where there is a strong combination of physical and, and psychological conditions like anxiety, depression, irritability, weight gain, abdominal pain. And whereas dysmenorrhea happens during menstruation, uh, PMS happens in the days prior to and can be much more severe, much more regular, and, and much more debilitating. Since this always is a question that comes up, not during this class, but in general, uh, what about sex during menstruation? There's actually no evidence that sex during menstruation is physically harmful to either the male or the female. Uh, many people do continue to engage in sex while, while others abstain. Um, actually, one of the positive benefits that's been found is, is it could can be, in certain cases, helpful in relieving cramps by dispelling blood congestion. So if it's something that, that you and your partner are willing to do, it, just be aware that there's no negative side effects. There may even be benefits, but it's not something that, that you have to do. So that work it out with your partner. Let's talk about contraception. Let's talk about oral contraceptives specifically. So for females, oral contra contraceptives typically are hormonal contraceptives that prevent conception. They tend to be a combination of estrogen and progesterone, and they, they are designed to basically prevent either ovulation from occurring or prevent implantation uh, on, of the uterine wall of the egg from occurring. Now, the adverse effects of these, again, those adverse effects that we talked about for estrogen and progesterone, nausea, acne, headaches, breast swelling, weight gain, fatigue, depression. So it shows that um, the, the oral contraceptives, when we're talking in the domain of hormonal contraceptives, can have some pretty adverse side effects. Um, there are 
other options out there. Actually, there's an option that, that they've been working on for a while. It hasn't been approved in the U.S., but it is approved in India. And that is where males are, are injected with a fluid into the vas deferens of the testes. Um, and basically what occurs is, is it breaks up sperm that's going through it. It's something that's injected in there. It's relatively painless. It's an outpatient procedure. And for it, it basically makes the male sterile for 10 years for when it comes to sperm. All the other hormones are still there, so it has no negative side effects. It just breaks up the sperm and causes the sperm to, to die as it's being ejaculated. Um, it's also something that can be reversed with another injection. And like I said, it tends to last about 10 years. So there is other th options out there other than these hormonal options. It's just we're, we're slowly moving in that direction, definitely not fast enough. In males, there's anabolic agents, uh, which is our adrenogenic steroid hormones or androgens, such as synthetic testosterone. When used properly, they can promote muscle growth. And, um, and when used properly, they, they, they do help with those who have androgen deficiencies. However, they tend to be misused by athletes and they can have very serious side effects such as liver toxicity, um, testicular hypofunction, hypo means reduced, so reduced function of the testicles, elevated cholesterol, cancers, erectile dysfunction. Um, all of these are things that can result from abuse of steroids. Again, I do not recommend them unless you're, unless you're advised by a doctor because the, the side effects far outweigh the advantages, the gains. In women, they reach menopause, um, it typically starting at about 40, maybe as late as 60, it's a range, but menopause is the permanent cessation of the menstru menstrual cycle. Um, Many women do get hormone replacement therapy. However, again, just like I said before, I don't recommend hormone replacement therapy just because we our bodies do these hormonal changes for a reason. There's actually no um, um, strict proof that hormone replacement therapy actually does anything. The, the Women's Health Initiative actually cast out on the benefits of hormone replacement therapy. Um, it's believed to, to reduce hot flashes and things like that, but all it really does is delay them. It doesn't reduce them in the long run. On average, menopause occurs at about the age of 51, and really what this results in is a drastic decrease in estrogen levels. Um, because androgen levels don't change, testosterone levels don't change, there can actually be a a period of time where, where women become more masculine during this time because there's a drop in estrogen, but the androgens stay the same. The last thing I want to talk about is reproductive cancers. So both uh, males and females have reproductive cancers. Males have testicular cancer. Females have um, ovarian cancers and cervical cancers. Uh, males, the, the testicular cancers are actually highly related to androgens. Too much androgen that's actually released by the testes can increase your rate of testicular cancer. Conversely, males who with testicular cancer actually tend to be treated with estrogen in order to reduce that. And it is an effective treatment. It's not 100% effective, but it is an effective treatment at, at helping eliminate um, male cancers, male reproductive cancers. Females, on the other hand, o ovarian cancer tends to be with too much estrogen. They're actually treated with the male hormone, testosterone. So males are treated with estrogen when they have reproductive cancers. Females with reproductive cancers are treated with testosterone. Just some interesting stuff there. So a bit of a long lecture there, but in review, we talked about sexual physiology for a little bit, and then we talked really long about hormones and development. Thanks. Come on back.